Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Excited. I am. Yoda. I didn't even mean to talk like that. Preemptive like. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord if you are new. My name is Connor. I like to learn. Phones away. If you are not ready to learn, you are in the wrong class. No big deal. Just home ec is down the hall. Make me some... Tiramisu or something. Um, yeah, uh, let's go. This episode is supported by The Great Courses Plus. Oh, yeah. Plus. Oh, oh, ah, ooh. Um, ah, uh, what was... Okay, so whales. So, I think that's so... Whales are such a cool concept. It's like... It was so everything started in the ocean, right? All life forms did, and eventually some evolved to be able to fit the niche, you know, get up on land and eventually completely leave it and have an egg that had its own casing and didn't have to be laid in water. And it, you know, but whales are like they, so they went from the sea to the land and then back to the sea, and maybe it happened a few times, but um, it's interesting, and you can kind of see like a hippopotamus is sort of, I, I'd imagine is sort of how this transition happened. You know, like a rhinoceros versus like a, a rhinoceros, which you don't think about as like a water animal, a hippo, you do. It's kind of like a land and water. And you can see if there became more water or if hippos were closer to the sea, then they could adapt more for feeding on like swimming and feeding on coastal stuff. And then could evolve more to be completely away from the land forever. And whales are fascinating. I don't like killer whales. I think they are the bullies of the ocean. Behind us, I guess. But humans are super smart. Way smarter than killer whales. I don't know why I'm saying that. Okay, let's go. We know whales as graceful giants. Oh, Some th are... this is uh, Theodora. Say hi. King George, say hello. You guys... Theodore, King George, the third, this prick. No, he's, he's okay. Eh. Okay. Powerful. Pay attention. This episode is supported by The Great Courses Plus. We know whales as graceful giants. Some are powerful hunters, some are gentle filter feeders, but no matter what they eat or how they live, whales as we know them are bound to the sea. But there was actually a time when whales could walk. The tale of whale evolution is a story about one of the most remarkable transitions in the history of mammals. The fossil Sorry, I just gotta say, I feel so good when, like, I know, like, the more I, I learn about things, like, the big, like, did you know this? And I'm like, yeah, I knew that. I knew that already, all right? I'm not a rookie here. Walk. Yeah, I know. The tale of you know, whale okay. evolution is a story about one of the most remarkable transitions in the history of mammals. The fossil record shows how these animals transform from tiny four-legged plant eaters no bigger than house cats to the seafaring giants we know today. This change was dramatic and kind of fast. Yeah, I'll react Fossils to that, from sure. over the past 50 million- Sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. That was my other video. The I'll react to that, sure. Sometimes you guys ask, what is that? It's just I react to a lot of videos and I'm trying to upload it to 1080p and then so I can upload it to YouTube. Um, and, and that's just it getting ready. A new, uh, it, it means like a new loaf of bread is out of the oven, you know. I was going to say something. Oh yeah, so you know Megalodon existed, obviously. And it seems like, especially before all the wailing of like the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, it seemed like there was perfect prey for super, super big predators. But the largest predator in the ocean is a sperm whale, I think. Let me know if I'm wrong. I guess if you want to call eating krill, uh, 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 that, of course, that's a form of predation when you, you know, a blue whale is, I, I, I guess, it's, it's not an herbivore. It, it's a predator. It's just that it eats very small things. So, but in order, in terms of a thing that kills whales, there's nothing around. And you'd think that something would sort of fill that niche to grow bigger than a great white shark or bigger than an orca up to like a, uh, a sperm whale size to hunt juvenile, even up to adult 
huge cetaceans, and yet there isn't one. At least not anymore. And uh, that's interesting. I would have thought there would be a super big predator to match the super big prey. This change was dramatic. There's no bigger than house cats to the seafaring giants we know today. This change was dramatic and kind of fast. Fossils from over the past 50 million years have revealed whale-like animals of all shapes and sizes, each like a piece in the puzzle of whale evolution. Smack in the middle of this amazing transformation. That, that, I gotta stop pausing. I just, I get each excited with evolution videos. Uh, that looks like like the midway between a hippo and a whale right there. Like a piece in the puzzle of whale evolution. Smack in the middle of this amazing transformation is Ambulocetus, a toothy predator the size of a sea lion and a striking example of a mammal order in transition. Ambulocetus lived about 48 million years ago in what is now Northern India and Pakistan. And its full name, Ambulocetus natans, literally means the walking, swimming whale. But scientists will tell you that it wasn't really great at either. In the water, it was a powerful swimmer, but not very fast or efficient. On land it was clumsy too, with legs that splayed out to the sides, a belly that almost dragged on the ground, and a snout that was so long and heavy it looked like it could barely lift its head. But Ambulocetus was- Wait, so it, it, it's- I, I was expecting it to like crawl like a walrus or a leopard seal or something, but it actually- its belly was above the ground, so it kind of walked like a crocodile? that was so long and heavy it looked like it could barely lift its head. But Ambulocetus was perfectly equipped for its environment. It lived in partially freshwater environments like river deltas, where it lurked in the shallows and grabbed whatever prey that came near its giant snout. Now, if a long aquatic ambush predator sounds kind of familiar, that's because Ambulocetus is basically the mammal version of a crocodile. It lived a lifestyle that was a lot like a crocodilian's, ideal for an animal that lives between the land and water. But despite their similarities, crocodiles and whales are not directly related at all. In fact, the group of mammals that includes whales and dolphins, known as cetaceans, are so... I don't like to be judgmental, but who the heck thought crocodiles and whales were related? Um, no judgment. I was going to say something else. Oh yeah, you know, that made me think. Um, you know like super heavy people, like the, like the learning channel, TLC? Uh, like 600 pounds, like people who are super heavy and like are bedridden and like you got to give them, they have to get some kind of exercise in order to be able to walk again. Well, why not use like a giant pool where like, I, I feel like if I was super heavy and I was like stuck in a bed, um, that, that, that would feel like so liberating. Like you'd be able to kind of move around and stuff. It, it, just a thought. I don't know. The group of mammals that includes whales and dolphins, known as cetaceans, are so different from other living mammals that it's been hard to figure out what exactly they evolved from. Interestingly, research done in both the field and in the lab revealed some surprises. First, in the 1980s and 90s, a set of genetic studies took sequences of DNA from whales and compared them to the same sequences in other living animals. And these comparisons showed that the cetaceans are actually most closely related to a group known as artiodactyls, hoofed mammals that includes hippos, pigs, and deer. Then a number of fossils found a little later seem to support the same conclusion. In 2007, paleontologists in Kashmir, India found the fossils of a 47 million year old hoofed creature the size of a house cat that they named Indohyus. It turned out that this tiny mammal had a specialized thickened ear bone that until this discovery had- it Looks like a mask. Doesn't it look like a face, like a mustache and a nose? and closed eyes and a mohawk only been found in whales. The bone, called an involucrum, helps aquatic mammals here underwater, and it shows up even in the earliest cetaceans. It also had other adaptations like for barnacle. life in the water, like really dense leg bones, a trait that helps keep mammals like hippos weighted down when they're walking through a river. But Indohyus wasn't a cetacean. It had four legs <laughs> I and heard that uh, hippos like actually run through the water. Like they don't even swim. They just like like jump and uh you know when they're walking through a river but indohyus wasn't a cetacean it had four legs and hooves for crying out loud it even had a special ankle bone called an astragalus shaped kind of like a pulley and that feature is only found in artiodactyls mm -hmm. 
I had to get coffee. It's shaped kind of like a pulley, and that feature is only found in artiodactyls. Some very early cetaceans have this ankle bone too, which tells us that cetaceans evolved from artiodactyls. So, Indohyus is now largely considered the closest non-cetacean relative of whales. Unlike Ambulocetus, it's not a member of the immediate whale family, but it shares a common ancestor with them, helping to connect today's artiodactyls. In other words, if Ambulocetus represents the transition from land to water, then Indohyus represents the transition from artiodactyls to whales. By the time the first recognizable whales like Basilosaurus show up in the fossil record about four... So, in the vestigial, like, legs of whales, they, they see commonalities of these type of legs, and so two and two together, that they evolved from similar species. Okay, makes sense. Whales. By the time the first recognizable whales like Basilosaurus show up in the fossil record about 40 million years ago, this group of mammals would never come out of the water again. But there's still a question of why? Why would a cute little deer thing end up leading a whole order of mammals to life in the deep sea? That's Food? a question that remains unanswered. Maybe there were fewer predators in the sea than on land 50 million years ago. Or maybe there was more food in the ocean and less competition for it. After all, from Indohyus to Ambulocetus, there are many adaptations that show us that the diet of these animals changed from land-based sources to aquatic prey. But food probably isn't the whole reason. Whales are predators, but the only other mammals that move from land to water are manatees and dugons, and they're both herbivores. So, as in many other areas of natural history, we don't have all the answers. So, I, I love learning about evolution, and I have a ton to learn. I think I've learned enough to kind of speculate, and so speculation, Jesus. Speculation, and uh, I'm, I'm no expert. Just So, it seems like the, the rate at which a species evolves, or the rate at which life form changes and eventually into a whole new species is a combination of the need to change and the niche, the, the need to change and the availability of a change. So if there's this niche around them that isn't filled, like say there's a certain like, plant vegetation that is nutritious and if an animal adapted its whatever digestive system teeth whatever it has to uh that it could take advantage of it but if there's no need to then it won't and if there is a need to but there's no niche then it'll probably die out but if there's a need to change and an availability of a change like an, a new option for food or whatever then it, it will happen. I, I don't know if I explained that very well. But. Yet. But still, let's just pause to appreciate the fact that it took less than 20 million years, about the I evolutionary equivalent of a lunch break, for this entire astonishing transition to take place. And there in the middle is the walking, swimming whale, linking whales as we know them to tiny cat-sized deer things just dipping their toes in the water for the first time. Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting PBS Digital Studios. The Great Courses Plus is a digital learning service that allows you to learn about a range of topics from educators including Ivy League professors and other educators from around the world. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash eons and use the slash eons helps out their, their channel. I mean, they need no help, but they deserve it for sure. Uh, awesome video. Fantastic. We'll let the uh, video play. A library of different well, video I know a lot of you will leave. About science, math, history, literature, Great video. or even how to cook, play Let me know in the comments, guys, if I said anything wrong or you can teach me something or hope you learned something or enjoyed that. Hope you're doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be good soon. New subjects, lectures, and professors are added every month, like the Introduction to Paleontology series taught by Professor Stuart Sutherland. You can learn about everything from plate tectonics to taxonomy hey, and George. more. With The Great Courses Plus, you can watch as many different lectures as you want, anytime, anywhere, without any tests or exams. Help support this series and start your free one month trial by clicking the link below or going to thegreatcoursesplus.com eons. What do you want to know about the story of life on Earth? 
let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to go to youtube.com slash eons and subscribe. Now, don't stop exploring. Check out some of our sister channels from PBS Digital Studios and find out what you'll discover next. Cool, cool. Ah, see you guys.